from the Cube Studios in Palo Alto and Boston, bringing you data-driven insights from the Cube and ETR. This is Breaking Analysis with Dave Vellante. Early phase Gen AI or request response AI has not yet lived up to the expectations implied by the hype. We believe agentic AI is the next level of artificial intelligence that while building on Gen AI, will go further to drive tangible business value for enterprises. Early discussions around agentic AI have focused on consumer applications where an agent acts as a digital assistant to a human. But we feel that when a consumer setting is involved, it's really a more of an open-ended and very complex problem. Rather, we're, we see more near-term potential for agentic AI focused on enterprise use cases where the assignment is easily scoped with a clear map to guide agents. Hello and welcome to this week's The Q Research Insights, powered by ETR. In this breaking analysis, George Gilbert and I share our thoughts on the emerging trends around agentic AI. We'll define what we mean, how it builds on and is additive to generative AI, what some missing pieces of the agentic AI stack are, and some of the likely players in the space. Now, before we get into the details, We'd like to clarify that we believe agentic AI has great potential in the enterprise, but is a potentially perilous journey for consumer AI. In particular, it's our view that consumer agents, where you no longer go to websites, rather machines go there for you and perform tasks, is like sailing off the end of the earth where the ship has no destination and ends up a derelict. Enterprise agents, on the other hand, have a defined destination and a clear route to get there. The ship will reach its destination because it knows where it's going. Now, George, this is an intriguing concept. You devised this, this idea. So why don't you explain it in more detail, please? Okay, so an agent needs to navigate systems to perform work on a user's behalf. And the core of an agent is figuring out how to navigate to, to get that work done. But so to do that, they really need a map and tools to accomplish this task. Now, consumer agents exist mostly in the wide open world of the world of the World Wide Web. And that's like Ferdinand Magellan declaring that he's going to go circumnavigate the, the globe and sailing off towards the West. For all he knew, he might have fallen off the end of the earth. He was trying to navigate the whole world without much of anything in the way of a map. Enterprise agents, on the other hand, are like running errands in a town where you, you have a map or, or already know where things are, you know, where the grocery store is, the gas station, the library. These are well-defined routes and tasks. The consumer agents will be possible eventually, but it's going to take much more technical work to get there the agents in the enterprise can do more valuable work a lot sooner. All right, thank you, George. Let's go back in, in the time machine. Just the last January, this graphic was introduced by A16Z at the time. It describes the emerging Gen AI stack. And basically it shows what we called upfront a request response model. In other words, a request is initiated via natural language and the data is accessed through a RAG pipeline to return an answer. The process is fast, it's quite impressive really, but the answer is often, eh, it's just okay. And at, at the, in the same or similar queries, very often will generate different answers each time. And so this model has delivered limited ROI for enterprise customers. Yeah, sure, there are some nice use cases like code assist, really nice actually, and customer service, writing content, and the like, but other than the price of NVIDIA, Broadcom, and some of, the, some of the other big AI plays, the returns haven't been there for mainstream enterprise customers. So we see the next incarnation of AI building on the previous picture with some notable additions. But before we get into that, let's define agentic AI as we see it. Agentic AI is the next level of artificial intelligence designed to per pursue goals with human supervision. The agent accomplishes work and invokes tools to do so. Agentic AI uses generative AI, but goes further than a system of request and response. Agents in this model make a plan to perform work 
on a user's behalf given a specific goal. Now, in addition, an agent can work in concert with other agents managed by a supervising agent that can orchestrate interactions between agents and coordinate outcomes. George, can you kindly give us an example, maybe using a supply chain situation? Okay, so building on, on something we, we touched on last week, let's, let's talk about sales and operations planning and the way Amazon does it. So Amazon, this is amazon.com, they forecast sales for 400 million SKUs weekly in terms of sales looking five years into the future. The reason they need to go so far into the future is they have different agents that have to do different things depending on um, the time frame and what type of work they need to coordinate. So um, a, a long-term planning agent might figure out how much distribution center capacity they need to build. Um, another might configure the layout of each distribution center that um, either exists or, or has not been built. Yet another might figure out how much of each SKU to order for each supplier for the next delivery cycle. Another has to figure out how to cross dock deliveries when they arrive so the inventory gets distributed to the right location. And then after the customer order is received, another agent has to figure out how workers should pick, pack, and ship the items for that um, order. But the key part is that these agents need to coordinate their plans in the service of some overarching corporate goal, such as profitability, with the constraint of meeting the delivery time objectives that Amazon sets out. So the decisions one agent makes about distribution center configuration has to inform how another agent will be able to pick, pack, and ship the order. So the analysis that each agent does has to inform all the other agents' analyses. And so this is, it's not just a, a problem of figuring out what one agent does, but it's coordinating the work and the plans of many agents. And that, that takes into account those interdependencies. Okay, so as we said, we see the next wave of, of AI as agentic AI, building on that previous A16Z stack with some additions that we're showing here. We've taken that, that picture that A16 uh, developed last January and then highlighted the areas where we see change coming. In particular, the focus, we start here with the orchestration box in the middle of this diagram. Today, the orchestration is all about using tools, be they LLMs or frameworks like Langchain or high level languages like Python to call models and data. Now in the future, we see the model doing more of the orchestration by invoking a sequence of actions using multiple workflows that call apps and leverage data inside those apps. Tools today return an answer to a natural language request and in the future, we see agents doing much more where the workflows are tapped to make a plan and perform actions. Now in the empty boxes that are shaped like, a, like an L on this diagram, we show the coming together of the digital and physical world, something that we've talked about extensively on previous Breaking Analysis episodes, where the world of people, places, and things becomes harmonized in a digital representation of the business, what is sometimes referred to as the semantic layer. But George, I know you feel that term understates the importance of these layers. You know, please add some color to the changes you see ahead that are going to define agentic AI. Okay, so let's let's talk about building on this framework from Andreessen Hurwitz and, and how it needs to evolve to support agents. First of all, um, where you have the dotted lines um, around the box that says APIs and plugins, those move from calling tools to actions that will invoke um, a legacy operational app or an analytic model. Um, and the action is essentially a workflow building block. Um, do a piece of work that's on the operational side or an analytic model might be tell me what should happen in the business or what has happened and therefore what should happen next. Those are essentially up-leveling tools into actions. In the word, in the, in the language of language models, um, these become verbs. Then the orchestrator in the middle, most of the workflow orchestration 
done today with LLMs um, is really in the the programmers um, specifying something in code. And in the future, the LLM becomes a large action model instead of a large language model. And it it generates the plan of action or the workflow. But for that to work, it needs to up-level the raw data that the RAG pipeline typically looks at. And that is where that digital representation of the business becomes important. That's the map. That says, what are the people, places, and things in the enterprise and the activities that link them? That's, the, that's what enables the agent to figure out how to navigate to accomplish its goal. And in the case of uh, Amazon, the agent needs to understand what's in the forecast to know how different inventory items relate to which suppliers, what those suppliers can produce, and how and where logistics can deliver their output. That's the role of that map. Okay, great. Thank you, George. Let's let's look into the building blocks that you just referred to for Agentic AI and double click on the the additions that that George just explained. So. As we said earlier, the orchestration layer changes from calling data to calling apps and using data inside those apps to inform the actions. The right side of this chart shows the connectors between raw data and a data product, i.e. a semantically meaningful object and the end result of complex pipelines. The lower left side is how you elevate operational apps to create actions. So Gen AI is useful because it enables natural language queries and allows us to make sense of APIs that can create a connector layer on an, an API and then turn it into an action. So RPA here is the plumbing. It can help take software robots that are wired to a screen layout or an API. And with Agentic AI, we see an LLM being able to learn to navigate a screen or an API when one is available, or it can learn by observing. The point is, much of today's RPA is hardwired with fragile scripts. This is a real problem that a lot of kind customers complain about. We envision a more robust environment that is much more resilient to change as these hardwired scripts become intelligent agents. Does RPA go away? No, you don't just get rid of the plumbing overnight. And Gen AI can help make building pipelines easier and less complex. And the power of a digital representation of the business is it enables building pipelines essentially on demand. So George, can you please explain why that is the case and elaborate on the building blocks of Agentic AI? Okay, so like techies like me get excited about these architecture diagrams, but the purpose of having to go back and sort of start from this these low level building blocks is that we can no longer buy the applications that run the enterprise off the shelf. 25 years ago, you bought SAP for ERP and Siebel for CRM. Then for emerging businesses, it was NetSuite ERP and Salesforce CRM. But those were for the cookie cutter business processes. Now enterprises need to build systems that embody exactly how they want to run their business. These are custom, but they need easy to use business blo uh, building blocks. So that starts as, as the foundation level with the application and data estate that companies already have. So as you were describing, that needs to be up-leveled and harmonized into a common language like nouns and verbs, um, where nouns are the data objects, verbs are the actions that we were talking about in, in terms of the connectors. And that becomes this semantic layer or digital representation of the business. And to be clear, that's why it's in red. It's not all there today in that schematic. And that is the most valuable piece of real estate in enterprise software for the next 10 years, at least, trying to build that. That is the foundation on which everything will be built. And it dictates how much is in place, dictates what type of tools you can use, and therefore what type of applications are possible. Now, so how we start building that is, uh, on the data side, today we build by code, by hand, we build code um, that turns raw data um, using pipelines um, into, let's say, business intelligence metric definitions. These are these uh, final data products. And we might use Fivetran and DBT and uh, a, a Spark pipeline. Um, but when that 
when that catalog we talked about in the past, especially last week, fully maps all the data into semantically meaningful objects, like Informatica, in fact, does today, then you can build new objects or data products on demand by automatically generating the pipelines. And, and that gets you to the bookings, billings, backlog type metrics or supplier on time delivery performance. This is what at scale and DBT metrics layer uh, and lookers look ML um, where, where you define these by hand um, today. That's on the data side. On the application side, as, as you mentioned, um, you can use LLMs to up-level raw um, application APIs or screens into actions. Um, and this is what the RPA vendors are doing. Um, so then if you go up a level, those are those, those building blocks. Then if you go up a level, you start to be able to build a digital representation of the entire business. And this is what Palantir is um, well ahead on, what Salonis has done by mining um, the logs of all application activity to stitch it together into um, a process map of the entire company. Salesforce Data Cloud does this for customer 360 in the data cloud and the customer experience connector maps all the processes for um, nurturing a customer from um, you know, lead to conversion. And then as we talked about in the past, relational AI and enterprise web are creating the, the sort of new essentially application definition um, foundation that's both a combination of the uh, application logic and the database in a knowledge graph so that you can build an end-to-end -end definition. Point is, we, we have some of the pieces, but we don't have all the pieces, so we can't put together the full map, but some have put that in place. And that's what makes um, then the building the agents um, more productive. Great, thank you, George. Let's let's come back to sort of our vision here and the conceptual view of the world and and what the sort of end game is here. Specifically, we envision a digital assembly line for knowledge workers that can be configured based on the knowledge of the business. So think of agentic AI as, as assembly lines. They're purpose built for knowledge workers. And we imagine turning the enterprise into a digital platform that organizes the work for everyone in the company. So to do this, we need to be able to construct something where the digital platforms that we're building will create assembly lines on demand for specific projects. And the work of building these digital factories is it's, it's ongoing, it's perpetual. Where for example, the management systems are constantly evolving to become more sophisticated. So the goal is that when there's work to be done, you can compose a process end to end very quickly and it's extremely precise. Now we have a clip from a conversation that George had earlier this year with Vijay Pandiarajan of MuleSoft Salesforce that provides some useful details on this concept. Please play the clip. One of the really interesting things is uh, the efficiency in which work gets done, whether it's with people or whether with, it's with agents. You know, I really think about them as uh, processes with people, systems, and bots. And, and really we've got all of those uh, functioning here. Uh, one way to look at the overall effectiveness of, uh, of a particular process, um, we gather the analytical information about the execution of these things, right? The auditability, the trace logs, all of that. We have all of that information. Um, we have the information that's in the customer 360 about what the customer has done as well. Uh, and the data graphs that are inside data cloud. Process mining becomes a really interesting way for us then to look at um, what, how are these things transpiring and what is the most efficient way in which these elements can be brought together. Uh, we haven't said much about that top layer where you, you know, what we're calling orchestration, uh, but really that it's a lot of these end-to-end -end experiences start with defining what an orchestration should look like. And then that's when these people systems and bots are actually working together. We now have the analytical information coming out of that system. Uh, and then process mining lets us go back and see how closely were we aligned to, to what we had initially set out, right? Like what, what is happening with our overall orchestration? Are we actually hitting the, the goals and the, the targets that we had? Uh, so George, 
Taking the comments from VJ in context, can you please explain, maybe build on the amazon.com example that you used before and explain how agents support management teams to build essentially management systems? Yeah, what, what we heard from VJ was the analytics um, taking a look at how work was performed and figuring out how can we do that better. And this harkens back to over a century ago where um, factories were designed around time and motion studies to analyze um, how work was done to figure out how it could be done more efficiently. And so this metaphor of building the digital factory is that essentially um, platforms are the assembly line for knowledge work and companies used to build or management, management teams used to build management systems, mostly around people and processes. But in the future, they'll be built more around agents and software that learn from their people and, and the operations. And they'll use the data as VJ was talking about from observing this activity. And then building the systems will involve continually improving the models about how the parts of the business should work, how they can work better. But all these agents' prescriptions will be driven by top-level corporate goals, whether profitability or the growth of the ecosystem that the company orchestrates. And the point is that management know-how that used to be in the heads of the management teams starts to get embodied in this system of software components that includes agents and processes that are defined. You're, you're engineering a system or this digital factory. That was the point of the metaphor. Yeah, so we're codifying, codifying that tribal knowledge. Um, let's, let's take a look at some of the firms that we see as key players in this agentic AI race and bring in some of the ETR data. This is data from the April ETR survey, the TSIS survey. And we've had to take some liberties with the categories and companies as there is no agentic AI segment in the ETR taxonomy. So we're generalizing here, okay? Now on the vertical axis is net score or spend velocity on a specific platform. The horizontal axis is overlap or presence within the data set of more than 1600 IT decision makers, ITDMs. And we have a number of representative firms that we think can lead and facilitate agentic AI. And we're also showing, so we're showing a mix of companies. We've got a, you know, open AI in there to represent large language models in the upper right, they're off the charts. We've got UiPath, Salonis, and ServiceNow in the automation space, uh, and, and analytics and data platform companies like Palantir, Snowflake, and Databricks. We've got integration and API platforms like MuleSoft, which is now Salesforce. We heard from VJ and Google's Apigee. We show Microsoft Power Automate, which is their RPA tool, but we show that as a proxy for the company's power platform, you know, the entire suite. Google, we've superimposed Vertex AI, which is its agent builder uh, AI that they announced at Google Next in April. And we've added Amazon Bedrock, the company's model garden, and Amazon Q, it's up the stack uh, application platform. So George, all these companies and many more, virtually all firms are going to use agentic AI in the future, whether they know it or not. I wonder if you could add to this narrative. So what you put together here, Dave, was it seems like a, many tangentially related companies but in fact, these are all critical players in collecting the building blocks. Um, so like Apigee, which used to be for managing APIs, those APIs are what gets, gets up-leveled into actions that uh, an agent would know how to make sense out of. Palantir and Salonis are two different ways of building that digital representation of the entire business. UiPath has um, now, uh, the ability um, to use Gen AI to accelerate and to make more robust how you build connectors that become actions, whether to screens or APIs. MuleSoft the same way, but MuleSoft also has these low-code tools um, that I'll tie back to the Power Platform that help um, citizen developers build uh, workflow agents without being superhuman, you know, and having to know how to navigate the open web. Um, Amazon Q and Amazon Bedrock are uh, 
will eventually be ways for respectively citizen developers and uh, sort of pro code or maybe corporate developers to build agents as well. Um, but Amazon will need um, a better uh, map of that digital representation of the business. And let me just point out with Databricks and Snowflake, they seem to be on top of the world right now um, because data is the foundation of all intelligent applications. But both of them need to somehow build that representation of the people, places, and things in the business because, as we talked about last week, we are opening up the data formats so that nobody owns the data anymore, that neither Databricks nor Snowflake will own the data. The value is shifting to the tools that define um, the process that data and, and turn it into people, places, and things, and then the agents and applications that do work on top of it. Now, the reason this is important is like at Analyst Day at Databricks, Ali was saying, well, you know, Microsoft with Power Platform, they'll just have these nice GUI tools that people won't really need anymore because people won't be interacting with apps. The agents will, and they don't need a GUI. But what's important is the Power Platform tools are so far the most advanced we've seen for enabling citizen developers to define these agents. Microsoft's still missing some pieces on that digital representation of what the uh, who the people, places, and things are. The point is, when you look at this map this way, you can see who's missing what, but how they're all trying to converge on the same thing. That's what's important, that um, they're, they're all pursuing the same opportunity, but they're coming from different starting points. Got it, thank you. All right, let's wrap up. Uh, with some of the areas that we see as gaps that need to be filled in order for our agentic AI scenario to play out. And as we said up front, we see agentic AI you know, really having an impact in the enterprise. And we see today's LLMs evolving, as George was saying, from models that can retrieve data via a natural language query to large action models or LAMs that can orchestrate a, a, a workflow. Now to really take advantage of agentic AI, we got to connect to legacy apps and we have to harmonize that data in those applications. And the example we use here is to ensure that things like customers, bookings, billings, and backlog, they all mean the same thing across the enterprise. Sounds simple, it isn't. And being able to understand and take action in near real time. And finally, your tool change to build and train agents in an ongoing fashion. Now, George, I wonder if you could share your final thoughts on Agentic AI and the likely time frame that we'll see this deliver tangible results for mainstream enterprises. Well, I think we're going to see agents show up pretty much anywhere Gen AI has shown up in enterprise tools. We're going to see a lot of splashy announcements related to consumer agents, but I think like, like the consumer web 25 years ago, um, it burst on the scene with a ton of um, energy, but we were missing the infrastructure for the consumer web um, to have a business model, for instance, to deliver goods and services. Amazon eventually solved that problem, but it took a number of years um, and we hadn't fully solved the advertising business model. In the enterprise, on the other hand, we can put agents anywhere inside uh, there's a tool with a user interface. One, because it, at the simplest level, it can accomplish a bunch of, or sequence of steps on behalf of a user. User expresses intent. The agent does a sequence of activities in a tool, but we can also build workflows. These are simple building blocks where you define the actions um, and the data that it needs to perform those actions, to figure out what actions to perform it's a much more scoped problem. Going back to the beginning, instead of send, you know, setting off to circumnavigate the globe, it's just, you know, find my way to the gas station or the grocery store. It's a much more tractable, tractable problem, and we can produce a lot of tangible value in a short time frame. Great, George. Thanks again. Fantastic analysis and, and depth of understanding as always. Really appreciate it. Okay, that's it for now. What do you think? Agentic AI is that the next buzzword or the next wave of enterprise value? Let us know. Okay, thanks to Alex Meyerson and Ken Schiffman on production and on our podcast, Kristen Martin and Cheryl Knight helped get the word out on social media and our newsletters. And Rob Hof is our EIC over at siliconangle.com. 
Remember, all these episodes are available as podcasts. Wherever you listen, just search Breaking Analysis Podcast. I publish each week on thecuberesearch.com and siliconangle.com, or you can email me at david.vellante at siliconangle.com or DM me at dvellante or comment on our LinkedIn posts. And please do check out etr.ai for the best survey data in the enterprise tech business. This is Dave Vellante for the Cube Research Insights powered by ETI. Thanks for watching. We'll see you next time on Breaking Analysis.